You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. Today I have three guests on the show with me, Kuei Hu of Ohio State University, Chen Zhu of the University of Cincinnati, and Lu Zhang of Ohio State University. Thank you all for being on the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. So Kuei, Chen, and Lu have co-authored a paper titled Replicating Anomalies. It's a large-scale replication study that retests hundreds of so-called anomalies in financial markets. So... First, let's start with the basics. Uh, what is an anomaly in this context? Uh, okay, so uh, anomaly basically is a predictable patterns in stock returns documented in the literature. Um, so, for, uh, so basically, you can construct variables based on past price data or accounting data or other data, and then use them to uh, predict future stock returns. One good example is the value growth anomaly. Uh, so basically, uh, stock with low valuations uh, they tend to outperform stock with high valuations uh, going forward. The reason uh, we call them anomalies is based uh, because uh, sometimes these evidence is cited as evidence against market efficiency. So in other words, uh, what do we mean is efficient market anomalies. Okay, so the efficient markets hypothesis is uh, somewhat dominant, and or at least when whenever you're running any kind of study in, involving finance, you'd use it as your null hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And so there's a huge literature where people try to find these cases where it doesn't hold, and those are those are anomalies, correct? Right, right, right. Yeah. So I guess I, I I personally do lab experiments, and if I were to replicate something, I would you know get my own data set, right? I'd get I'd get different lab subjects and run the same study. But mm. since this is looking at stock data, and and since stock data is you know publicly available in general. Doing a replication study must be must be a little different, and it must be kind of difficult because you're looking in general you're looking at the same data set that the original authors would have looked at, maybe a lot with some extra data points at the end to account for the time difference. So how do you deal with the the how did you find a, a different data set to test all these hypotheses on? I, I guess for some fields. Um... Concerns might be more about um, you know data sample size, data data uh, quality. Uh, I guess uh, for finances, we have pretty standardized large data set has been look look at many times for a long time. So uh, we have kind of fewer concerns about the uh, the data. Uh, our main point is actually more about um, you know the empirical uh, testing procedure. So basically, uh, our point is if you use more robust procedure, then some of the findings will weaken substantially. Um, I, I guess that's uh, why uh, we are less concerned about uh, using alternative data set. Yeah, I mean, so just to be clear, we're using essentially the same data set uh, that the original authors are using, and uh, but we extend it right to include more up-to-date market data. Right, the main difference is about the procedures we're using to uh, to verify the robustness of uh, of this long list of anomalies. Right, that's where we differ. Well, we don't really disagree on the data set; we disagree on the methodology. So in economics, uh, including finance and accounting, the meaning of replication uh, is uh, slightly different from replication in, for example, medicine, um, oncology, or psychology. And uh, there, uh, people do experiments. They collect their own observations. So their replication means more like reproduction. Reproduction. You do exactly what the original studies. Uh, did to gen- including the procedures used to collect the sample, whereas in economics, uh, finance, and accounting, we are more observational uh, sciences. Uh, we we observe what we have uh, in the real world. We we collect the data. So there, so replication really means uh, uh, scientific replication that we we draw different sample from the same population. We use a similar but perhaps not identical procedures to evaluate. The fr- uh, fragility of the or, or, and the validity of the original results, and um, I'm citing Daniel Hammermersch's 2007 article at the Journal of um, Economic Survey. Right. Okay. So these hypotheses are stated in fairly strong terms. So if they turn out to be true, then it shouldn't matter if you slightly change, you know, the the way of approaching the question or or 
you know, add a few additional data points. If they're true, they should have approximately the same effect when you approach Precisely. them in different ways. Right, right. Right, right. I mean, I think what we are questioning is the per- pervasiveness of the original result uh, in the sense that, you know, as you said, um, if the original hypothesis is true, then they should apply to not only just tiny stocks, but as well as to small stocks and big stocks, right? And I think that's where we find that um, many of the past anomalies do not stand up to replication when we use robust procedures to minimize the impact of tiny caps, what we call macro right. caps. So in the literature, so sometimes we do uh, have the possibility of going to international market and look at different data set, but uh, that's uh, yeah, not the point we try to make in this paper. Yeah, how many anomalies did you end up testing and how many turned out to be significant? Right, so we look at a total of 447 anomalies, and uh, if you impose the typical hurdle of uh, round two, um, pre- uh, it's 1.96, and then uh, only 36% or 161 of them are significant. Mm-hmm. And if you following the recent uh, argument that a high hurdle should be imposed so with the hurdle of three, so only 15% of them is uh, are significant. So the hurdle is the, the p-value T-stat. at which you... Yeah, T-stats, T-stat. right. Okay. right. 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 So that sounds pretty bad. And th- these are all things where people in the past have done studies and found... S- found them to be significant, um, and published those studies, a lot of them in top journals. Um, right. So, I mean, 161 out of 447 is still more than we would expect purely by chance if none of the effects held, but it's not not nearly as many as, as one would hope. Right. right. But remember, in those original papers, right, we are basically, if you take those original papers or results at face value, then we have, you know, 447 uh, significant anomalies, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, so the the question is, what, what's your, uh, what's your known, right? What's your, uh, what's your prior? And uh, if you take these results at face value, then all of them are significant. So I think um, any 161 of them uh, are, end up being uh, robust is, to us, is quite surprising. Yes. Right, right. May I um, may I just add mm-hmm. one point? Um, uh, we should say most of the 447 anomalies were reported to be significant in original studies. There are a few, a very, very, uh, there are very few uh, variables, but several variables that are actually reported to be insignificant, that, but the vast majority, yes, was reported to be significant in the original studies. So your working paper uh, made a splash on the internet uh, when, when it was posted in May, and I heard about it when Alex Tabarrok blogged about it at Marginal Revolution. Uh, So in preparation for this, I read some of the comments in different places online, and one common complaint was about the use of value-weighted returns rather than equal-weighted returns. So um, first, what's the difference between those two things? And second, why does it matter? Uh, well, so first, uh, I think people complain about this is uh, because uh, for a long time, many people use equal weighted uh, portfolio returns as the, kind of a, the, the conventional uh, construction. Uh, but uh, our point in this paper is precisely uh, using equal weighted returns can be very problematic. Uh, so the key difference is value weighted returns, you will give uh, weights to uh, bigger firms. So basically, weights is, are proportional to uh, their market cap. But when you do equal weighting, you will give the same uh, weights to all stocks. Um, however, we uh, we point out in the paper that uh, there are a lot of tiny stocks. We call them micro caps. Um, they uh, are very big in numbers. Uh, um, they count for 60% of all listings. But uh, if you add up their market cap, uh, it's only 3% of the aggregate market. So, uh, so in the paper, uh, our results show if you do equating, um, uh, there could be several several problems. Uh, for example, you might exaggerate uh, the magnitude of the findings as well as significance. And also, we also discuss uh, that the micro caps can be very hard to trade in reality. And hence, uh, that's you know putting into question the economic relevance of the findings when you do equal weighting. And also, uh, uh, the investment capacity will be relatively low if you uh, follow equal weight. Okay, so so yeah, that, that makes sense that if you do equal weighted returns, it means you're putting a disproportionate weight on these these micro cap stocks that only make up for 3% of the market. And so right. value weighted seems to make a lot more sense if what we're concerned about is 
the behavior of the market as a whole, which is driven much right. more by the bigger stocks. Right. And, uh, and, and one more thing I want to add is that if you think about the sort of the typical in- experience of an average investor holding a portfolio of stocks, right? Over time, mm. some stock price will go up, some stock price will go down. And uh, unless you rebalance monthly or maybe weekly or daily, otherwise, if you just let the portfolio run, then your experience from holding this portfolio of stocks for six months or a year will be more accurately reflected by value-weighted returns rather than right. equal-weighted returns. Right. And um, and let me add one more point. So um, so 3% for total market cap for micro caps is on average uh, in our entire sample. So in fact, the economic uh, significance of micro caps has declined in recent decades. At the end of our sample, which is um, the end of December 2014, micro caps actually only account for 1.4% mm-hmm. of total market cap. So that's really, really tiny. Okay. So um, let's go through some of the specific anomalies that your paper fails to replicate. You say that 95 out of 102 liquidity variables fail replication, which is about what we would expect by chance if there was really nothing there, nothing of importance in liquidity variables. So um, what are these liquidity variables and why did economists think they mattered for stock returns? Right. So to give some examples, um, uh, you can think about uh, trading volume, uh, share turnover, and uh, when you trade it, whether the bid ask spread is high and also whether uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, uh, price impact when you trade. Um, and intuitively, uh, the reason they matter is because uh, if it's difficult to trade, then if this imposes uh, some additional cost for investor and the investor would accordingly uh, demand for compensation. And uh, more importantly, liquidity uh, level, uh, liquidity can vary over time, right? If you think about market crisis, liquidity can drop and hence this imposes some additional risk and the uh, investor would uh, demand for further conversation so uh, so this is why uh, why uh, we we want to see whether the liquidity is is an important factor for for stock return right so so the stock market I mean if, if we take it as one market among many different markets it's one of the most liquid markets uh, in existence right. compared to something like the market for uh, you know single family homes or something where the turnover is very right. low but still we might yeah you know, we might think that in times and places where it's less liquid that there would be a difference but it seems like you know from reading your paper that's not the case and and that these in particular are are um, not real effects that people are finding do you have any other examples of things that weren't replicated yeah, so I think uh, uh, to circle back to your earlier question, why did economists uh, think liquidity uh, mm. would matter for stock returns? I think a lot of it, a lot of it, was related to the financial crisis, uh, 2007 to 2009, um, uh, after the bankruptcies of um, Lehman Brothers and early on Bear Stearns, and everybody was aware. Uh, keenly aware of the importance of liquidity uh, for financial intermediary and the mortgage-backed securities market and over-the-counter uh, markets and corporate bonds. So naturally, and people, uh, and at the time, and the stock market really uh, dropped uh, tremendously. So, so um, we were actually surprised by our results ourselves, and mm. we did a little bit of uh, smaller analysis in our 2015 paper published at the Review of Financial Studies. And back then, we only looked at uh, 13 liquidity variables, and we found that 12 of them were insignificant. But we didn't take that evidence seriously. We just dismissed it. We thought that it was not a big deal. It must be we were not looking at the broad uh, scale of liquidity variables. And then and, and in, the, in this paper, once, I, once we went all the way to 200 and uh, as uh, 102 liquidity variables and about uh, 93 percent of them uh, were insignificant, and we get uh, we were like, "Whoa, this is important!" and uh, and um, um, this shows that a lot of liquidity premium in equities only exists in you know 1.4 percent to 3 percent of um, uh, market cap in the overall equity markets. Uh, of course, this doesn't mean liquidity is not important for other markets, and we believe uh, liquidity is important for corporate bonds and other uh, markets, but just Less not trading. important for equity 
market. At the same time, uh, we also know that uh, the published papers on liquidity on stock market, uh, they usually, they, <laughs> they are less clear about uh, where exactly uh, its liquidity effect showing up. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the papers, uh, the published studies all claim uh, liquidity variables are important for the cross-section of re equity returns in general. So I think uh, we have an uh, um, important message uh, to communicate to the profession and uh, liquidity. It's only important for a small fraction of equity markets. Right. Yeah. So the bottom line is it, it only matters as far as pricing is concerned for the bottom 3% of the market value. For the, re for the remaining 97% of the market value, uh, you know, small stocks and uh, uh, mega cap or big cap stocks, then uh, it doesn't look like uh, investors are demanding return premium for holding uh, relatively illiquid stocks. Okay. So let's clear up some, some uh, confusion I might have. Um, when these models... Uh, were, or these these theories were testing for things that could predict stock market returns, but something could mm -hmm. be important and and not predictive in in that it might just uh, you know the the variable changes and it affects the price concurrently. So you know it's you can't act on it uh, in order to earn a return, but it it could still affect the price. Is is that correct? Right. Among microcaps, transaction costs could be an important concern, right? So uh, some of the predictability patterns will be there, but, um, but uh, as an institutional investor, for example, and that would be very hard to exploit uh, in practice to trade on these patterns to make money. Okay. Uh, so, are there are there any of the these literatures that uh, that replicated better than others? Are there are there some winners in this process? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, right, the liquidity literature category turns out to be the biggest casualty of our replication. Uh, but there are categories of anomalies that do better. For example, momentum category that includes a lot of anomalies. Basically, momentum means that you trade on, you buy past winners and sell past losers. Uh, has to be recent past six to 12 months. Uh, you buy winners and sell losers. You keep them for six to 12 months going forward, and you have to rebalance monthly. And that strategy, that class of strategies are uh, going to keep making money. And uh, we find a lot of them uh, remain significant. Um, uh, that said, uh, even, even these significant anomalies, uh, we find their effect size, their magnitudes of average return spreads are lower than, than the magnitudes reported in original studies. And that's momentum. We talk about momentum as also value versus growth. Uh, it's another uh, very famous uh, class of anomalies. Uh, uh, they do well as well. And we also have investment category and profitability categories of anomalies. Uh, they tend to do well. Uh, these are reliable uh, return forecasters in what we call broad cross-section that is outside just 3% of tiny microcaps like liquidity variables tend to live within. Um, and another another category of anomalies that doesn't do very well is the what we call intangibles. Um, that includes uh, that category includes lots of variables, uh, but uh, but uh, we don't find them doing very well. Intangibles in what sense? Intangibles in the sense like uh, property plant equipment, and that's tangible assets. Mm -hmm. So intangibles include, uh, let's see. Think about the brand name, mm -hmm. like the brand right. value of a company, <laughs> right? and. Think about the, you know, if you come up with a way to measure the human capital, right, right, within a company, right, and try to use that measure to predict returns, that's the sort of intangible category we're talking about. And those ones don't do so well. They don't do. Oh, they, there are significant well, ones, but um, more uh, a bigger fraction of them turn out to be uh, not robust to replication. Right. So you take these these anomalies, you have this huge literature, you show that many of them don't replicate. Uh, and then towards the end of your paper, you you argue that a Q factor model can explain most of the remaining significant anomalies. So why don't you tell us uh, what is a Q factor model and how does it work? Yeah, sh uh, sure. I can give a you know kind of simple description of the model, and then we can discuss the uh, motivation or how we develop the model. So um, so this is a uh, stock return benchmark model we uh, developed in a early paper published uh, review financial studies. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the, the, 
the message is that, um, well, the average return on stocks is determined by exposure to four so-called factors. Uh, we have four factors, a market factor, a size factor, a investment, and the profitability fact, uh, factors. So we show uh, this model, if you compare with uh, the conventional models such as from a French model, uh, it performs um, uh, significantly better uh, when you look at a large set of uh, anomalies. Yeah, so that paper we show the empirical performance is, uh, is uh, you know, it's pretty good uh, relative to conventional models. Okay, so the model fits and it, it helps to explain the anomalies that are significant and d- not the ones that aren't, because obviously you don't want your model to be telling you things are true when they're not. Okay, interesting. Uh, and what uh, what nice thing uh, is about this model is not just empirical performance. Um, so the thing is, we motivate this model, um, you know, based on economic argument rather than just uh, you know empirical findings of stock return predictability uh, from the past. Right. I mean, just to elaborate on that, then, for example, the famous Pharma French three-factor model that uses uh, market the size and book to market in their 93 paper, and that uh, that's a purely empirical model that is motivated from that their 92 paper uh, based on cross-sectional regressions uh, documenting size and book to market the forecast future returns. So uh, as for the Q-factor model, we actually started with theory, with economic theory, and it's based on uh, um, uh, optimal capital budgeting and net present value rule in capital budgeting. So, so intuitively, um, managers will take, uh, imagine if you are a CFO in a company and you are going to take an investment project only when its present value is higher than its investment costs for the project. So, so if you keep behaving optimally, so the last project you take, so it's the marginal project you take, the last infinitesimally small project you take, is going to satisfy the condition, optimality condition, that the present value equals investment costs for that project. And therefore, imagine if the company has lower cost of capital going forward or else being equal, and the, uh, the company is going to take on more projects. Uh, because they can afford uh, uh, the company can afford the more investment costs to uh, to to be equated with the uh, uh, higher present value uh, because cost of capital is low. So that uh, motivates the investment factor, which is building on a negative uh, theoretical relation between uh, investment and the cost of capital. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the NPV rule, net present value rule, also motivates the, um, uh, our profitability factor, uh, return on equity factor. So basically. If you see a company that um, that has high cash flow and the profitability level is high, but for some reason the company is not investing a whole lot, and then you can infer based on what we teach in corporate finance that present value rule, that company must have high cost of capital going forward, and that high cost of capital must be used to uh, must must offset the high profitability level, and so that present value for the firm's projects is not that very high. It's not very high, so the company doesn't invest a whole lot so and that's the that's the economic underpinning beneath our q factor model so uh, so far uh, many people have replicated uh, our q factor results uh, in this um, follow-up paper we replicated our own results both our investment factor and the profitability factors have t stats above five uh, that's uh, from a statistical sense and that's that's not bad at all and in fact that's actually uh, kind of impressive and uh, for example the recent paper by uh, Harvey Liu and Zhu and very very influential paper published at the Review Financial Studies 2016 argues that um, a new factor, newly discovered uh, factor needs to pass the hurdle of three. And on top of that, if a model, if a factor is motivated theoretically based on first principle of, uh, of economics, as our factors are, and that the hurdle, the statistical hurdle for economic factor ought to be lower. So in fact, uh, we passed the t stat of hurdle of five. So uh, we are we are pretty happy with the with our Q factor model. Okay, and and just to to clarify for the uh, people who haven't taken a statistics class in a while, we talked earlier about p values. Uh, those are better when they're lower. You want them to be lower if you, and that, that's when you say you found a significant effect. Now you were talking about T stats where higher is better. So five would be very right. high, very statistically right. significant. Right. That means P value is really, really low. It's like close to zero. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, 
So um, this study is part of a larger replication crisis in science spanning many fields. It's the sort of epicenter of it is social psychology, where, where people recently showed that many of the results don't hold. So clearly, this problem of publishing lots and lots of results that appear significant and turn out not to be isn't just a problem with the finance literature, but there's something wrong with the way people are doing science. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on the replication crisis in general? Well, I, I guess one, one point we're discussing paper that applies to any field is the, uh, uh, the, the publication bias. So basically, it's difficult to publish any uh, insignificant results. Uh, um, and uh, also, you know, some fields such as economics and finance, uh, we don't really pu- publish many uh, replication studies. And uh, these, these bias, uh, you know, uh, creates pr- uh, incentives for data mining and then uh, potentially leads to more, uh, you know, force, force findings. Yeah, it's it's very good that uh, that you guys are, are doing a replication study. We tend to think of, uh, I, I guess, a big part of academic research is trying to signal that you're uh, clever and original, and uh, and so finding right. finding a new result and or a counterintuitive one is is some there's a strong incentive towards that. Replications right. are more something that you uh, assign master students to do as a, as like an assignment. They're not generally thought of high as high status but when you do for over 400 replications then it, it becomes uh you know it, <laughs> interesting right so i want to i want to add a little bit about the our our replication rate of uh, only 36 percent so this may i mean if uh, if someone's never been exposed to the replication literature and um he or she may think oh 36 uh, percent something is very seriously wrong with the with the literature so i mean having studied the literature for a while we we come to the realization that uh, in a sense this may be how science works <laughs> so there's this famous paper by uh, john ionidis uh, 2005 very famous paper and uh, ionidis develops a theoretical model in which he calibrates uh, reasonable value parameter values for statistical power uh, for the x and the probability of uh, tested relation being true um, as well as uh, as well as some other parameters that I'm, that I'm not remembering right now so bottom line is that uh, even without the researcher bias uh, or publication bias so the rate of um, um, that the, the, what he calls predictive um, um, positive predictive value uh, is not is not 100% it can easily get down to 75%, uh, probably lower, especially in, in empirical finance, in the, in the anomalous literature that uh, we s- devote our careers to uh, studying right now. So it's actually, I mean, so the low replication rate is not very surprising to us now, now that we have thought about it. But the reason is that uh, statistical power of asset pricing tests is not very high. So, um, in elsewhere, in empirical uh, economics literature, uh, Ioannidis and two co-authors published a nice paper uh, recently, a couple of years ago, at the Journal of Economic Survey, in, in which they document the uh, power of uh, empirical economic studies is only 18%. Many of them uh, have even less power. Whereas in finance, uh, empirical was surprising, and we do have more data in the sense that we use uh, stock returns oftentimes uh, monthly, that's what we do, and some people even use daily and higher frequency data, and uh, lots of uh, stocks, thousands of stocks in the cross-section. So you may think a sample size is large, but uh, but to keep in mind that the target of our analysis is expected stock return, and which is highly elusive in the sense that uh, its common proxy we use, which is average future realized returns, is notoriously uh, noisy. And uh, many authors uh, have established that um, uh, observation empirically, just average returns are very noisy, meaning the sampling variation is, is tremendous and can vary uh, all over the place. So if an author, not very careful or less experienced, uh, run a statistical test in a small sample and find the big instead and go ahead and publish it, uh, he or she may be just running on small sample. And, um, and uh, going forward, then those 
uh, findings may not be replicated at all because of large sampling uh, variations. So, so, so in a sense, uh, it may be the inherent nature of our field. And nevertheless, uh, that said, um, uh, we also have some extensive discussions in the paper that um, that we are hoping to impact uh, in a positive way uh, of our research culture uh, in the sense that we do need to take a replication study seriously. We do need to spend uh, uh, more time uh, confirming and replicating the existing uh, findings instead instead of just taking them at face value. And again, so data mining can happen uh, consciously or subconsciously, and oftentimes uh, it happens subconsciously. And we need to we need to make sure that uh, we build our economic theories, finance theories based on a reliable set of uh, empirical facts, uh, not just uh, uh, force force discoveries and then um, and then uh, when working on uh, this paper uh, I mean as noted earlier we ourselves were surprised by uh, by several findings ourselves because uh, because ex Andy our prior from reading the literature published literature is that the liquidity will be important and there's also something called the distress anomaly uh, that the firms are more distressed to earn earn actually lower rates of returns going forward uh, than firms that uh, that are less distressed which is which is kind of intuitive uh, but it turns out in our in our application that the evidence uh, doesn't hold water so this i mean we were going to write a theoretical model to explain that uh, so we don't have to do that anymore <laughs> mm, yeah so it seems like in science if you don't do replications and you reward significant results then you know, people are maybe not going to be malicious or deliberately uh, skew things, but, you know, you, you, you have some hypothesis, you, uh, you write up a few lines of R code, you hit uh, go, and, and it's not significant, and you have to think, should I spend the next few months writing this paper knowing that it, it doesn't have a high payoff for me? If, it, uh, if I publish this, I won't be publishing it in a top journal because the result is not that interesting. And so you you know you try something else until something works, but but then when you do that, you don't uh, you know you don't account for all the degrees of freedom that you had in in trying six or seven different things before settling on one. Yeah, totally. The um, the, the the p value of being uh, the p value of five percent being the traditional hurdle um, <laughs> is very hard to interpret under uh, multi testing scenario you just described. Um, if uh, if an empirical researcher looks at the data at many different times, look at a different uh, look, 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 so so if you look at the hundred uh, specifications, you find the five that work that will be five percent. But if you looked at the one thousand specifications, you're gonna you're gonna find the five five zero. So uh, so if you report like is as if that you only run one hundred uh, uh, tests, for example. So the p value is really hard to interpret. So I think um, I think a more careful um, use of uh, stats is called for, and we are we are also hoping to to impact on the cultures um, a little bit in, in the sense that we need to take um, ex ante uh, economic theorizing uh, hypothesizing more seriously and think about the Ionidius framework that would be increasing his ex ante ratio of a true relation being tested uh, divided by the number of false relations uh, being tested. So again. So so theorizing extent it would work uh, would help in that regard and um, and uh, make us closer uh, to the to the truth as opposed to being a victim uh, consciously a subconscious um, victim of small sample variation. So my bottom line is that take economic theory more seriously would work, and this also applies to uh, our Q factor model, for example, uh, as mentioned earlier. Even though our uh, investment and our factors have T stats exceeding five. Uh, but the, the Q factors are not uh, entirely immune to p hacking or data mining. So in our paper, we 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 we, we suggest that uh, going forward, uh, that someone and maybe ourselves in, down the road uh, may look at the global data, international data, to do more out of sample testing for the for the Q factors yeah, as well as uh, uh, cross validating them in different uh, asset classes, not just uh, equities but also corporate bonds. Maybe private firms and uh, and uh, and the country indexes, for example. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, can I add one more point? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So as you said, uh, replication study is not uh, are not sexy because you don't uh, produce novel, exciting new results. Uh, but I think one pe- positive uh, message from our paper is really that uh, you know uh, with you know uh, you know better technology, uh, cheaper compute uh, computing computing power. Uh, it, sometimes it's hard to just using more sophisticated statistical method to control for um, data mining. But if if the, the field can work together and establish uh, you know the best practice for testing methodology or other you know the way you process data, uh, I guess that uh, helps address the, the the concerns and reduce the amount of uh, false discovery. Do you have any closing thoughts? Anything we didn't cover that you think is important? Well, uh, I, I guess our you know you know we start to see a lot more discussions on you know replication data mining uh, uh, concerns in the literature. So hopefully our paper can contribute uh, you know significantly to this debate, and uh, hopefully that leads to you know positive changes uh, in the field. My guests today have been Kuei Ho, Chen Zhu, and Lu Zhang. Thanks all of you for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks. Thanks for having us.